We're about to begin our song service. This time Janet will pray for us. Praise God. Thank you. Can we all bow our heads? Amen. Okay, our first song will be number 248. Oh, how I love Jesus. Two four eight. Next song will be number 632, until then. Why 
next song will be number 109, Marvelous Grace. At any time you guys have a selection, you can just raise your hand. Good morning and happy Sabbath. How are you this morning? Oh, you seem, you seem, let's try that again. Let's try. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Oh, okay. All right. All right. It happens to me too sometimes. You wake up, something catches you by surprise, you weren't ready. Welcome to uh, the wonderful worship service we have today. Um, as you can see, it is communion Sabbath. And uh, because of that, everything is special. Even my voice sounds special. You may notice that my voice sounds more resonant and echoey. I went to a training about AV, so I now know that this is reverb. So when my AV friends have a chance, you can take off the wonderful reverb that we need when we use it for singing. But anyhow, the point is, uh, I want to welcome you. I have a few brief announcements uh, for you before we continue with our worship service. Um, but before I make my announcements, there are a couple of people who have special things to point out to you. Um, so I'd like to invite them to, to, to come up at this time, uh, Sister Janet and Sister Bina, um, and they're going to share with you um, some of the things that are coming up in the life of our church. Come, 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 on, come, on, come on, Bina, both of you. If you stand together, then no one stands alone. 
And uh, so who, who would like to be first? Okay. Yeah, get me off. Hello, church family. Uh, I have a few announcements from the school. Uh, belatedly, I wanted to thank you all who came for the International Food Fair. It was a great joy and pleasure to see everyone there after two years. Uh, I like to, know, and we also raised more than $6,200. Amen. 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 That's more than any other food fair in my memory. Uh, we have one more week left for our annual readathon, which is which ends next Sunday. So far, we've raised almost $8,500. Mr. T's goal is 20000 so we're about a third way there. And lastly, we have our live in-person spring band concert featuring uh, our very own North Shore Adventist Academy band and as well as Gurney Band, led by Mr. Martin. Uh, the time, the date is on May 22nd. It's a Sunday, and the time has changed to 4 o'clock. And after that, there will be refreshments available afterward. We hope to see you all there. Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Um, so, um, AV, can you please put on the announcement for, oh, yeah, there you go. So, on next Sabbath, May 14th, uh, we will have, um, we'll be hosting, it is um, Evidence-Based Weight Loss by Dr. Michael Greger. Um, I know it's a boring subject. It's weight loss. I know it's weight loss. But um, in reality, we all wanted to lose weight, right? I might, maybe I'm wrong. Anyways, so it's a free event on May 14. It's going to be uh, 2 30, starts at 2.30 to 4.30. One hour video presentation by Dr. Michael Greger. And after that, we're going to have a trivia. And since it's We'll start at 2.30. We'll be um, offering as uh, light refreshments. After all, it's about weight loss. No, you will be feeling <laughs> it's a healthy, healthy refreshments. You won't go starving for that two hours. I hope uh, you can share it to your friends so that uh, many people will uh, be blessed with this um, health, uh, weight evidence, Evidence, weight loss. <laughs> Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, Pastor Felipe has a couple of announcements for us as well. Thank you, Pastor. Um, good morning, church. Good to see everybody. Uh, we just have one short little video we would like to show. I wonder if AV is able to pull that video up for us. Thank you so much. I'll go ahead and take a look at the screen, folks.
Thank you so much, uh, AV. Um, we just came from a wonderful little uh, Pathfinder Campery, and we were so excited to soon and very soon, church, restart our regular Pathfinder Club activities. Amen? Amen. Amen. We're very excited. Uh, so in the next week, anybody that would like to enroll their children in Pathfinders, we will have some announcements in regards to that next week. Um, and anybody that has been a part of this past campery, we want to invite you to a short little meeting on Zoom this afternoon so that we can debrief and talk more uh, about that. So we just ask the church, please keep our Pathfinder ministry in prayer. We are looking for not only new Pathfinders, but also new staff members that will be able to come alongside us, partner up with us, and be able to be a part of these wonderful events. It's about more than sleeping in tents and, you know, making a campfire. It's about practical discipleship for teens. That's what Pathfinders ministry is, and we hope to have your support. Thank you, church. Thank you so much. Can we, uh, can we celebrate God for what happened last weekend? Thank you so much for the leadership of Pastor Felipe. Those tents that you saw were pitched with our own fair hands. Yes. They did not blow down. Th thank you. Brother, Brother Jim knows. He's, he knows the challenge. Listen, so if we can do it, so can you, is the simple message. We had a great time, and thank you so much to the Tigus. Guys, we have never eaten so well at a camp. Um, I'm starting to wonder whether, it, all I know is that in the time of trouble, I'm going where they go. That's, that's all I know. Wherever, whatever cave you guys are in, leave me a space. Uh, <laughs> in, in all seriousness, we really appreciate uh, what you guys did. So just... Um, F final brief announcements. Um, ah, there is also there is a video for the food fair. I just got communication. Would you like to show that now? Okay, we're going to show the food fair video and then I will I will wrap up. Wonderful. Thank you so much to the school. We have such an amazing school, and it's fitting because the, the next thing I wanted to share is that this week has been Teacher Appreciation Week, and I just want to say thank you to uh, Mrs. Newbold uh, and the Newbold family. Uh, Mrs. Newbold is the chair of our school board who has done several things this week to make our teachers feel appreciated. And I also want to give a shout out to my wife who, working with the student council, also did things to make our teachers feel appreciated. We want to let you know from the church that we appreciate all of the teachers 
uh, North Shore Adventist Academy. Can we give them some encouragement? Can we give them, whether you're here in person or watching online, we appreciate you. But we also know that we have teachers that are a part of our church community that you don't teach at North Shore, you teach maybe at college, you teach in high schools, you teach elsewhere, maybe you even work uh, in childcare. And if you are here, we also want to know that we appreciate you. Thank you for shining your light in the corner where you are. We even want to appreciate those who homeschool, you are teaching in your own homes. Whatever role you may play in educating the next generation, we just want to say that we appreciate you and we're praying that God sends you a special blessing. We also want to value our Sabbath school teachers. You also play a very important role in the life of our church family, and we want to recognize that. Tomorrow is a special day. Uh, it is Mother's Day, um, and we are all very thankful for our mothers, whether our mothers are still with us or whether our mothers are resting, waiting for the resurrection like mine. We just want to say thank you to God for our mothers and to all the mothers who are here and all the mothers in Israel. We realize as we saw that video of the food fair, we're such a diverse community. It's such a strength that we have. We have been mothered by people who are not related to us by blood, but are connected to us in Christ. And so we just appreciate each and every one of you the way that you continue to shape our lives. We know it is often a thankless task, but we just, uh, this small moment of recognition, we hope, goes a little way to communicate the true sentiment of our hearts. Thank you so much for worshiping with us at this time. We will continue with our worship service, and may God's Spirit touch your hearts as we come to Him today in communion. Amen.
this time we are going to have a moment of prayer, and I want to invite uh, Elder Alda uh, to come and give us our prayer. As we are uh, pr- making a posture of prayer, let us kneel. Um, let us kneel. Okay, Elder Werner, I apologize. Thank you so much. <coughs> Eternal Father and O God, we have come before you this morning with an attitude of gratitude. We have come, Lord, just thanking you for the great privilege we are basking in this morning, seeing that we can come before you and we can pray. It is such a privilege, Lord, to be able to pray. And we realize, Lord, that the needless pains that we bear most of the time is just because we have not come to you in prayer. So as we come this morning, Lord, we ask that you will create in us a clean heart and you will renew a right spirit within us. You will come divinely near us, O God, And you will help us that we will understand that even though we have messed up and messed up so many times, Lord, even sometimes blatantly, that you are a God who has provided grace for us. And we are sin abound, much more grace abound. And so we come to you this morning, Lord, thanking you for giving us this opportunity to sense the importance of prayer. Lord, we come before the communion table this morning, and there are those of us who are still wondering if we should come, mainly because we have disobeyed you so many times this week. We have done our own thing We have not listened to you, but Lord, we are here, and we just ask that you will help us to understand that we do not come to the communion table because we are holy, but because we want to be made holy. So Lord Jesus, please baptize us anew with power from on high, and help us, O God, that after today, when we walk out of this place, others will see that we have been with you, and it is our desire to walk with you as long as you are willing to hold our hands. So even when we have to climb up the rough side of the mountain, Lord, we ask that we will count it a joy, because we know that at the end of it all, There will be no more pain, no more sickness, no more death, no more heartache. The former things will be passed away, and all things will become new. So whatever we are going through today, Lord, and I know, I know, Lord, there are those of us who are going through hard times today. We are questioning We are asking, Lord, I'm doing all all I can. Why? But help us to understand, Lord, that whatever you do in our life, it it is a means of perfecting us. It is refining us, Lord. So help us not to murmur. Help us not to complain. But to keep on climbing up the rough side of the mountain for the end of it all. It will be the end of the conflict, and you will come and save us. So bless our activities today, Lord, and help us that our greatest desire will always be to love you more and serve you better. 
This is our prayer in Jesus' name. I would like to welcome and greet those of you who have come today specially for uh, the dedication of uh, Richard and Ify's baby, Jaden. Life is an is a interesting thing. Um, they are currently fighting unusual traffic, and so we're going to move that uh, later on in our worship service, possibly uh, towards the end of our worship service. But at this time, we would love to invite uh, Sylvia Rivas, who's going to share special music with us. Jesus
impossible. I believe in you. I believe in you. You are powerful. God above it all. I believe in you. I believe in you. You do miracles. Be impossible. I believe in you. I believe in you. You are powerful. God above it all. I believe in you. I believe in you. You do miracles. Be impossible. I believe in you. I believe Jesus. Jesus. Oh, how I need you. You stay the same. You are good in your way. Jesus. Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, oh, how I need you. Thank you so much, Sylvia, for reminding us through this message and song of our great need for our Lord and Savior. Would you bow your heads with me as we approach God? Father, in this moment that we have right now, would you speak to us clearly and powerfully through your word? In your name we pray, amen. We find ourselves here at this table again. And for those of you, whether watching online or here in person, who may be our guest today, um, it is a part of our tradition as Seventh-day Adventist Christians to celebrate the Lord's Supper, to celebrate communion once a quarter, once every three months. Now, if you're wondering, why do you do it once a quarter? There are some churches that do it every week. Some churches do it once a month. Um, we are not clearly told in Scripture uh, how often to have communion. But we are told as often as we do, we should do it in remembrance of our Lord Jesus. And so it's been part of our tradition that we do it about once a quarter. And... Some have said, some have said, I, I don't know if this is official or this is just us trying to make sense of our practice, that the reason why we chose this uh, frequency is that we were trying to balance between doing it often enough for it to be meaningful, but not so often that it started to lose its meaning. Now, again, I don't know. There's, there's no text I can show you. There's, there's no quote that I'm aware of from the Spirit of Prophecy that, that makes that case. But that's what I've heard uh, some those who are older and wiser in the way than me say. And it, it has me thinking this morning about what does communion actually mean? What does it mean? And more than that, uh, what do any symbols or rituals that we have as a part of the life of our faith mean? How do they work? Well, we could have a wonderful conversation, and perhaps uh, another time we, we might, uh, about uh, 
the origin of the symbols and the different ways in which different church and faith groups over time have wrestled with what it means. There are certainly some Christians who see the bread and the wine as being literally becoming the body and blood of Jesus Christ. As Adventist Christians, we hold to the broadly Protestant perspective that no, this is an emblem or a symbol of what Jesus did for us on the cross. And yet, we find meaning in this symbol. But I've come to realize that if a symbol, if you start to forget what a symbol points to, what it means, it's, it can turn into superstition. Let me say that again. If you have a symbol and you forget what it means, it can become superstition. I don't know if that you have any superstitions in your culture or in the way that you grew up. Maybe you don't really believe it, but it's just a part of the culture. For example, if somebody sneezes in my presence, I have to find myself saying the words, bless you. It's like a, it's like a, a, a knee-jerk reaction, like a reflex. And some time ago, I, I, was, I discovered why we say this. I don't know if this is said in other languages, but certainly in, in the English-speaking world, it's part of the, the, the culture. And it comes from a time many hundreds of years ago when people believed and understood that when somebody sneezed, it could be evidence that they were experiencing some kind of spiritual uh, possession or control. And you might think, well, that doesn't make any sense. Why would someone think that? Well, perhaps you would, to understand that, you'd have to know that in many languages, the word for breath and the word for spirit is the same word. And so in those ways of thinking, when somebody suddenly breathes out, very literally in their language, a spirit just came out. And somehow that got connected with the idea that uh, sneezing might be some sign of some negative forces. And so the practice became to pray a prayer of blessing when someone sneezes. Now you're laughing, but in these COVID times, <laughs> oh, we have our own superstitions around sneezes and coughs. And, and, and listen... You know, maybe praying when someone sneezes, you know, that could help with them not getting whatever disease they might have. But that's why we say bless you. But when I say bless you, I have none of that meaning in my mind. It's completely lost its meaning. And to me, it's just a polite thing. I mean, I don't think it's a superstitious thing, but just a polite thing that you say to the point that some people have actually gotten upset. I may or may not have been one of these people. When you sneezed and you look around, and no one, not even your own children that you feed every day and brought into the life, says bless you. I mean, what kind of a world are we living in when a brother can sneeze all by himself and no one cares? <laughs> Something so simple. And yet, if you forget where it comes from, you can start, it can start to become superstitious and you can start to have all kinds of other things around it. Some of you perhaps come from cultures where when you cook and you put some salt in the dish, you also throw some salt over your shoulder. Any of you have, have that in your culture? I, I, don't know if, I don't know if you know where it comes from. Uh, but it comes from the idea people used to believe that, you know, we're living in this spiritual world and the enemy is always around and maybe he's looking over my shoulder. And I just want to, if he's trying to look over my shoulder and mess with my life, well, he's going to get something in his eyes. No, I, I don't know that those people literally believed that the devil could get salt in his eyes. I think it was more of a symbolic thing of saying, even when I'm cooking, I want to cook with God's presence in my life. It was a symbolic way of saying that. But over time, it lost its meaning. And now there are some places, man, if you don't throw the salt, well, the food can't taste good, you know, we're going to have bad luck for six months. And then who's the poor person who sweeps all this salt? I don't know. Tomorrow's Mother's Day. I think I do know, actually. But <laughs> when a symbol loses its meaning, it can become a superstition. What does communion mean? Now, for those of you, and I'm also one of you, so for those of you who have within you, a little part of you that is interested by conspiratorial things. This next part of the sermon might be somewhat disturbing, but I did a search this morning, and I discovered that the word communion is not in the Bible. 
Don't, don't, don't get scared. Don't get scared. Some of you are like, that's it. I'm never doing communion again. In the Bible, we have the term the Lord's Supper. But the term communion that we all use, at least in the English-speaking part of the world, is something that was created to describe what the Lord's Supper means. And the word communion literally means come with union, oneness. So communion literally means to be together, to be one. And of course, when we, when we read the story of communion in the Bible, we can clearly see that this is what Jesus was trying to teach his disciples and ultimately us, the importance of being one with him and one with each other. But if we lose sight of what communion really means, if we lose sight of what the symbols really mean, it's possible that we can start to experience superstition around communion. Some of you are saying, Pastor, you're clearly preaching to the wrong congregation. We are Adventists. We don't have superstitions or traditions. Okay. I have known of some people, maybe some of you are here today, who came to church on Sabbath and saw the emblems, and had a moment of panic because no one warned them, no one told them that there would be communion. And they have this idea in their mind that there are certain things, and maybe it's because of how they were experienced church, how they were taught even by their elders, but you have to do certain things to prepare. And if you come unprepared, then you might be in trouble. There are some who have perhaps less spiritual reasons than that. I didn't moisturize my feet. And uh, some, of, some of you, this is not an issue for you, but for some of us, listen, I don't want you to see what I'm working with down here. So I'm not going to go to the foot washing, and if I don't go to the foot washing, I'm not going to take communion. But I will never tell you that. I will, I will, I will, I will you know, kind of allow a, 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 a general vague sense of spirituality to pervade my, oh, no, no, not, not this month, Pastor, no. But really, it's not something that important. And we avoid, we, we, we miss out on the blessing because in our mind, communion has come to mean something else, whereas what communion truly means is about being one with each other. There are others who have different, and, and we respect them. Listen, I'm not here to point fingers, just to, to reflect with you. In my role in the hospital, I've, as I've been sharing with you, I've spent more times in the hospital recently visiting with people who are in need, both those of our community and both those of other Christian uh, con persuasions. And there are some for whom receiving communion is very, very important. If I were to go to the hospital and, God forbid, I didn't come out healthy, and I didn't receive communion. Some wonder, will I be saved? I've been a Christian all my life. I've given my, myself to God all my life. But if I miss a communion, might I miss out on glory? And I can respect the concern if that's the way that you understand it. But that is not what communion was originally intended to teach. It was intended to be a symbol of our oneness with God and with each other. I want to turn to Scripture now. In the book of John, John chapter 15, we're going to read from verse 11 to verse 17. John 15, verse 11 to verse 17. And this, just for context, is a part of the longer message that Jesus shared with his disciples after communion, after the Last Supper. So if you go back to 13, you'll realize it's all one continuous uh, moment. Verse 11 says this, these things I have spoken to you, Jesus is saying. He's been telling them about loving each other and all these sorts of things. These things I have spoken to you, why? That my joy may what? Remain where? In you. Jesus is saying, in other words, if you come in line with, with, with my teaching, you will discover that there is a joy that remains in you that is not of human origin. And the good news, brothers and sisters, is that if you have a joy that's not of human origin, then as Jesus said, because the world didn't give it to you, the world can't what? Take it away. Jesus says, if you, if you, I've spoken these things so that my joy may remain in you, that your joy may be full. Verse 12, this is my commandment, what? That you love one another as I have loved you. 
Verse 13. Greater love has no one than this. What? Than to lay down one's life for who? Now, this is the one I want us to focus on for the next few moments before we go to the ordinance of humility, otherwise known as the foot washer. Greater life has no one than this. Sorry, greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his. Notice Jesus did not say for his family. Now, I'm not here to say that if you sacrifice for your family, that doesn't represent love. Of course it does. Notice he doesn't say for his members, but for his friends. Why might Jesus be using that term? By the way, we don't have time for this, but if you read 3 John, I don't know if you've read 3 John recently. Fascinating little letter. 3 John, the same John who writes this, at the end of his letter, referring to the church brothers and sisters, calls them friends. He says, Greet the friends, the friends here greet you. John has somehow, it seems, taken this word from Jesus and started to use it and apply it as a term to describe who the other members of the body of Christ are to each other. Friends. Friends for whom Jesus has laid down his life. Why is the word friends so important? And what does it have to the word have in connection with the idea of communion, togetherness, oneness, common union? A brother or a sister is something that you have no choice over. Those who are your brothers or sisters, they come to you through the choices and actions of your parents, right? None of us have any real say in the matter. And there are some of us who have brothers and sisters who we are not very close to, for whatever reason. Maybe they are just in a different time zone. Maybe there is something in our relationship that blocks that, that closeness. But you can have a brother, you can have a sister, you can be related, you can be a part of the same family, but you might not be together. You might not have communion. You might not have oneness with each other. You might be brothers and sisters, but you're, but you're not one. The word that we often use in church circles to describe each other, we talk about church members. I am a member of the church. Don't we use that word? It comes from Scripture. Originally, in, in Corinthians, uh, Paul talks about how we are all members of the body of Christ. The, the, that's the word that is used. Originally, that word meant like organ, like heart, lung, you know, hand, member of the body. Over time, at least in the English-speaking world, the word member has started to shift its meaning to mean one who is a part of a special group, usually because they pay to be in it. Thank you so much, Janet, for talking to us about evidence-based weight loss. I am a member of a gym. I am a member. Yes, I am. I pay my membership fee every month, faithfully. Yes, yes. Now, I don't always go to the gym. I'm a member, but I don't always go. And I'll be honest with you. When I do go to the gym, I go to the gym for me to get the exercise I need when I have the time and I feel the motivation. And when I go to the gym and I want to use a certain piece of equipment and I see somebody else sitting in my seat. Yeah, I'm still talking about the gym. Do you think this is about No, this is about the gym, guys. What a, if this is applying to your spirituality, that's, that's, that's on you. I see someone sitting on my bench. I feel... Oh, they're taking my place. Or if the gym, I see another gym down the road that's shinier and nicer and the bathrooms are better and the, the daycare for the kids options are nicer, I might change my membership because after all, I go to the gym for me. I don't go to the gym to help somebody else get healthy. I, I have enough trouble working on my own health. So if, 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 if you can get healthy, great. Just don't get in my way. We don't have to talk to each other. Don't be rude to me. I have made zero friends out of my gym membership. I don't go to the gym to make friends. You go to the gym to make friends. I hate those people at the gym who are on the equipment talking, hey, hey, how you doing? Oh, it's been a... just, just lift the weights and move out the way. I've got places to be. Because I'm a member. 
Some of us have taken this idea of membership unintentionally, but we apply it to our connection to each other here at church. We're members. Why? Because we believe the same things, yes. Maybe we support the church with our finances and our prayers and our attendance, yes. But I come to church for me to get the blessing. I need. It's been a tough week. Elder prayed. Some of us are climbing up the rough side of the mountain. And when I come to church, fight traffic, get my clothes on, wrestle with the kids, and then I get here, and someone I don't know is sitting in my seat. I, my family have sat here for generations. And then the toilets aren't as nice as they used to be. And there's this new church down the road that's, you know, they, they have a different stuff. And listen, I've got no issue. If you want to try other churches, I'm not saying that. But my point is the, the membership mentality where I primarily see church as the place I go to get my spiritual fill and then leave. This is antithetical to communion. And so I don't want to scare you. I'm not here to scare you, but I just want to suggest to you that if you eat a very delicious, and thank you to those who made it, piece of bread today and drink the grape juice, that might give you a little bit of nutrition and help you to make it home after the long worship service. But if you have no common union with God or with each other, this will not avail much in your life. It will be a nice superstitious thing like saying bless you or throwing the salt over your shoulder. It probably won't hurt, but it's not going to give you the power that it's intended to symbolize. Jesus said, no greater love than this has, has anyone in this than someone who lays down their life for their friends. Why friends? Because you choose your friends. I can go to the gym because I like the gym even though I hate the people. I can have a brother because, well, my dad had kids and we're brothers now, so that's it, and we don't have to have a relationship. But I can't do that with a friend. A true friend, I have to actually get to know them. I have to risk rejection to walk up and say, hey, my name is Jonathan. What's your name? Some of you are looking at me like, what are you talking about? Do you remember when you were in grade school? Remember when you Remember when it was easy to make friends? Do you remember that? I'm starting to forget. As the grays come in and the hair recedes, so does memory. I remember it used to be easy to make friends, right? You've got a ball. I want to play with the ball. Now we're friends. You're on the swing. I'm on the swing next to you. Now we're friends. Or in my case... Your parents let you eat candy, mines don't. Now we're friends. Now we're friends. <laughs> and you would spend time together. You would talk together. You would play together. You would look forward. Some of you remember, you would look forward. Remember the days when friends would come and knock on your door? Did they do that here in Chicago? They used to do that in the UK. We, we call it going to knock for your friends. Some friend, you know, and at the time we thought we were big. We were nine, we were big. But as a parent, I realized like some skinny nine year old comes to my door. I pay mortgage for. Can Jonathan come out to play? Okay, for, for, who are you, first of all? <laughs> Where do you come from? What's your background? Could you give us a resume? We can discuss this and then decide. But she would risk that. Why? For the joy of playing with a friend. Jesus uses the word friends to describe how he feels about us and how he hopes we feel about him and about each other. Now, yes, of course, we are brothers and sisters in Christ too. And yes, we are members of the church. But my question is, are we friends? A friend knows the name of a friend. One of the most, Pastor Felipe, I'm going to expose us right here. One of the most scary moments in my ministry is standing at the door at the end of the sermon. Because my brain tries to remember all the names. And some of you, I know, you've told me your name four, five, six times. And it went into the same place 
in my brain that my last password that I had to change on my internet account went into. And I've forgotten. And so you know what I say? Sister! <laughs> Brother! And I mean it with my heart. But if we're friends, I know your name, you know my name. If you're friends, I, I know what's happening in your life. I, I know your kids' birthdays. We've gone to each other. You've eaten in my home, I've eaten in your home. If we're friends, when, some, when you're going up the rough side of the mountain, I know why. I pray for you. Well, this part we might not like. If we're friends, sometimes we even have disagreements, but we make up. I, I've argued with my friends. Real friends can disagree because they know their relationship is strong enough that they can make up. Ask any husband and wife here. <laughs> it's impossible for myself, Felipe, our elders, the deacon, whoever you want to put in, all of the, the people in leadership, to cultivate true friendships with all of you. We love all of you. We like all of you. Well, most of you. No, all of you. All of you. We like, we like all of you. But it's hard to be friends. The time it would take to really get to know each other. This is why communion is supposed to represent that as the church, we have common union relationships with each other. One of the things that is such a blessing to my life is how much love and support and prayers I get from you all. Genuinely, genuinely. But I sometimes wonder as I stand here and I look out, there are some of you who have been coming for months, for weeks, for years. And no one, no one sees you. I know it's because I stand on the front with a bow tie, I'm kind of hard to miss. But how do we cultivate the kind of church where not only do we love and support our leaders, which you guys do, but we learn how to love and support each other as friends. Jesus said, greater love has no one than to lay down their life for their friend. Making a friend means letting go of some piece of my life. It means making room in my heart, in my home for someone. It's not always easy. It's saying not without sacrifice but it is the way of the cross. Jesus, as we wrap up, he says, verse 16, you did not choose me, I chose you. Friendship, it's about choosing. And appointed you that you should bear much fruit and that your fruit should remain. That whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. Verse 17, last verse, these things I command you, what? That you love one another. COVID has created many challenges. One of the challenges we have had is that for a long time we were not able to be in the same space with each other. It's hard to be friends with people you don't see. Now, I got the privilege of being here every week, even when there were just 10 of us, right? <laughs> for some of you, you're still coming back. For some of you, you're still watching online, and we understand, we respect that. But I want to challenge you, however you are engaging right now, can I challenge you that your spiritual life will be far more richer if you have friends who are also on the same spiritual journey with you. And that's why in the Adventist church we practice the ordinance of humility. It's a symbol, not a superstition. We have some water downstairs, we have some basins. Yes, it's been a long time since we've been able to do this. I'm so excited that we are able to provide this once again. And Jesus, as he symbolized this before the Last Supper, he says to us, listen, before you come to the table, how about you go and talk to someone else? How about you wash each other's feet, symbolizing your humility before God, your humility before each other, but your willingness to be there for each other as friends? And then come together and eat from the Lord's table. May this communion remind us of the need
for more than just attendance, more than just membership, more than just being connected by the blood of Jesus to the same Father, but for the need of real relationships with one another. May you come to be able to say, yes, I am your brother. Yes, I am your sister. Yes, we are members. But also, we are friends. Let's pray. Father God, thank you, Jesus, for coming. Yes, as our Lord. Yes, as our Savior. Yes, as our older brother. But you came as our friend. You chose us. You didn't have to. But you decided to step out of heaven, step out of your comfort zone, step across the aisle and face the possibility of rejection so that you could get to know us, so that you could build relationship with us. And ultimately, you showed your great love in laying down your life for your friends. Lord, we want to be like you. This communion table is a reminder of what you have done for us and what we ought to do for others. Help this communion not just to be a superstitious ritual, but may it be a beautiful living symbol of the kind of church community by your grace we are becoming. We are one in the spirit. We are one in the truth. But we are also one in heart because we are coming to know each other as friends. This is my prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. So it's been a while, so I will remind you. Downstairs we have water prepared for all who would like to participate. If you go downstairs, you will find in the music room, the old youth chapel, is a place prepared for the gents. Uh, you will find in the gym a place prepared for the ladies. Uh, you will find in the uh, youth Sabbath school room a place for families. So any families who would like to serve each other, you can do that. And here in my uh, study, for those of you who prefer not to go down and up the stairs, there is a, a place also prepared for you where you can wash each other's feet. Our deacons and deaconesses are there to serve. Um, please, those who are ready, those who are willing, let us participate together and then we will come back to eat from the Lord's table. God bless you.
Can we all be seated as we prepare for communion? We're gonna be doing some songs. Okay, our first song would be number 312, Jesus Keep Me Near the Cross. Next song will be number 306. 306. Draw me nearer. 306.
Well, we come to the table of the Lord, and before we pray a blessing over the bread, I would like to read in your hearing 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23 and 24. It reads, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Deacons and deaconesses, let us kneel together. The rest of us, please bow your heads as we pray for the bread. Father, we come in this moment remembering what you did for us. You chose us, we didn't choose you. And yet, we scorned you, we mocked you, we crucified you. And yet, you did it for us because you considered us your friends. Lord, it's in humility that we kneel, we bow our heads as we remember what you have done. And as we eat this bread, it symbolizes the communion, the connection the relationship, the friendship that we want to have with you, the tight bond of commitment. But Lord, it also inspires us to look around and to see each other who equally are your friends and to desire a closer relationship with each other, one where we forgive one another, we love one another, we help one another, we know one another, until that day that you should return. And we should all go to live with you. Bless this bread. May it truly fuel our fellowship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I just want to encourage you to facilitate easier service. If you would move as close to the end of the rows as possible. If you're in the middle and there's space to move closer to the end, that will help us as we serve you.
Amen. Have we all been served? Then let us eat in remembrance of him. Amen. Amen. We are taking our next reading from the book of Corinthians, chapter 11, verse 25 and 26. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Chapter 26, I mean, verse 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the lost death Day he comes. May God bless the reading in Jesus' name. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this practice of remembering how much you sacrificed for us. Father Almighty, we need you. As we drink, as we eat, cleanse us. Make us a new person. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen.
have we all been served? Then let us drink as a remembrance of the new covenant in his blood. Amen. It is our custom here uh, on a communion Sabbath that we give uh, a special offering to those less fortunate than us in the form of giving a gift to the community services ministry. Um, and so, um, but I'm, I'm looking and I'm seeing Richard and Ify, are, are you guys ready? Okay. Come, come and join us. Come and join us. Um, I mentioned to you that there is a, a family who have come to bring their child to the Lord. And um, we're going to bless young Jaden. Um, family, if you're here, friends of the family, come forward. We appreciate your presence. This is a time of blessing. We have celebrated the uh, life that God has given us in his son, Jesus Christ. And we want to have a special prayer as our closing act before we leave for young Jaden. <laughs> I want to say, parents, it is a special blessing to have a child. It's a special blessing to have a son. Someone made in your image after your likeness. It's also a special responsibility and I appreciate your friends and family being here, uh, representatives of your extended community, because it certainly does take a community, a village to raise a child. But I want to say this to you, that the blessing that we are going to pray for young Jaden today, you have the opportunity to build on this blessing, or you have the opportunity to block this blessing. There are many people who came as young babies in their parents' arms to church and a minister prayed for them. Most of us don't remember that minister's name. We don't remember that time. But there are things in life that as parents, as extended family, that we can do which will either build on this prayer of blessing right now or it will inhibit it. And so as we're praying for Jaden, we're really praying and committing together we're making a covenant with God a commitment with God that we will do all that we can uh, to raise this young man to know him so the first piece of this the way that you can build in the blessing is in your home the only if the only place that Jaden hears about Jesus is at church that's good but it's not enough your home needs to be a place where he often sees you praying where he sees you singing songs of worship and praise to God, where when you have problems, even between you as, as a couple, as all couples do, he sees you able to forgive each other and go to the Lord in prayer. But the second piece of building on that blessing is where when Jaden uh, gets older, he's going to spend most of his time, which is in school. That place is going to have a pivotal role in shaping the man that he will be. Of course, you will show him by example at home, but if when he goes to school, the school that he attends is not reinforcing uh, what you're sharing at home, then you're going to be battling. And so I encourage you when that time comes to think carefully and wisely about placing Jaden in a place where the teachers pray, where the curriculum is in align with biblical values, and allow me to humbly recommend our dear wonderful school here but we know that there are other options. The point is, though, that the way that you can bond this blessing is making that his educational experience also lines up with what you are doing at home. And the final piece is where you are today, church. This is our family. This is our community. These are our friends. He's going to need to have friends as he grows who were raised in the church with him, who know the experiences of faith like him. And we encourage you uh, to find a place for Jaden, uh, that is a part of the church family. If you do those three things, 
and God will indeed bless you. Now, some of us, it's our testimony. We only had two. Maybe we had a strong home. Maybe we went to church school. Maybe we went to church and God blessed us. Some of our testimony, we just had one. Home was not that great. School was not that great, but we had a church that loved us. Or maybe we didn't even have church. We didn't have school, but we had a praying grandmother. God can do amazing things, but we're going to give him the best chance in life when we bring all three, the home, the church, and the school together. And so those of you who can, we're going to ask you to kneel with us. Mom and dad, we're going to ask you to kneel with us. And we're going to pray this prayer of blessing over his life. Jaden, you're looking at me like, if you hold me, I'm going to shout in, in power. So I'm going to let dad hold you, but I'm going to put my hand on your shoulder as a son of blessing. Let's pray. Father God, I pray and thank you for the life of this young man. Thank you for the blessing that you have given to Richard and Ephi in young Jaden. Thank you for all that his life represents, the hopes and the possibility for the future. Lord, we are thanking you the for the grandparents and the aunts and uncles that are here right now, celebrating and rejoicing that another child has been added to the family. Father, we ask that the home would be strong. That would be a place where faith, a place where your name is often prayed and sung and praised. Lord, we're praying that you'd bless them in their work, in their finances, so that when the time comes, they can choose the best educational options for Jaden. But Lord, we're also praying that this church would be a family to them, mm -hmm. that Jaden would have friends here, some of them may be born, some of them yet unborn, but his would be a life of growing up with people his own age mm -hmm. who also know and love you. Mm -hmm. He will face challenges, he will make mistakes, none of us are perfect, but when he does, may he know, Jesus, that you are a friend of sinners mm -hmm. and that you are the lover of his soul. Mm -hmm. So we pray blessing on his life, we pray favor on his life, we pray prosperity on his life. Amen. We pray that you would give him health. We pray that when the time comes, he might meet that amazing young woman who takes his breath away, but whose heart is also committed to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We pray that their union would be a fruitful one, that they would have many children, Amen. and that as long as time in this world lasts, mm. through him there would be a godly lineage in the world. Amen. And we pray all these blessings in the name of Jesus. Amen. amen. And amen. 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 Thank you so much, family. Thank you so much, family. And so as we sing our closing hymn, stand with us, church. Stand with us. We're going to sing our closing hymn. And as we do so on the way out, please remember community services so that the blessing you have received can bless someone else. Thank you for worshiping with us today.
Under his wings may the Lord bless you and keep you. Under his wings may he make his face to shine upon you. Under his wings may he lift up the light of his countenance upon you. And under his wings may he give you peace now and forever. Amen.